The Fruitless Fig Tree by Edward Dor Griffin Luke thirteen six to nine He spake also this parable A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then he said unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it shall bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. In this parable, the vineyard represents the visible church, and in a larger sense, the world. The trees are the members of the visible church, and in a larger sense, mankind in general. The planter and owner of the vineyard is God. The dresser is the Lord Jesus Christ. The first idea suggested by the parable is that men are placed in this world for no other end than to bring forth fruit to God. For what other end are fig trees planted in the vineyard but to bring forth fruit? You are not sent into the world to buy and sell and get gain. The only reason why you are here rather than not here is that you may have an opportunity to serve your Creator and Master. Another idea suggested is that God has an absolute right to all the services which men are capable of rendering. Shall not he that planted the vineyard eat the fruit thereof? Has not he who created the materials of which you were made, and then formed them into men, and breathed into them immortal souls, and created the world and placed men in it, and owns it all, has he not a right to all the services which you can possibly render? Can you be justified in living to yourselves a single hour? Another idea is that to render his vineyard fruitful, God has appointed one to dress it. This dresser, the Lord Jesus Christ, waters his trees with the dews of heaven. Fences round them with his protecting providence, prunes them by affliction, and supports them when they are ready to fall, until he can lift his hand to heaven and say, What could have been done more to my vineyard than I have not done in it? He has made a full revelation of God and of a future state, of man's duties, ruin, and recovery. He has given his word and ordinances. He has sent out his spirit. He has filled the world with expostulations and entreaties, until it can be said, If they hear not these, neither would they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Another idea is that God attentively watches men to see if they are fruitful. The owner of the vineyard is represented as coming year after year, that is, as often as fruit was to be expected. God attentively observes men as often as they have an opportunity to perform public or private worship, to hear a sermon, to drop a word of instruction, to relieve the poor, or to cast their gifts into his treasury. On such occasions he fixes his eye upon them as though they were the only objects of his attention. And as he is always expecting fruit, he always watches them. His eyes follow them into every corner. If a sinful deed is done in darkness... If a vain word is uttered in secret, if an unhallowed thought lurks in the heart, lo, he knoweth it altogether. We are further taught that there are some trees in God's vineyard on which when he comes year after year seeking fruit, he finds none. Every unregenerate man is of this description. Though his life may be regular towards his fellow men, Though he may observe the forms of devotion and even transact with covenants and sacraments, yet as his heart is always under the dominion of selfishness, he never brings forth any fruit which a holy God can approve. There are many who not only do not bring forth good fruit, but are constantly bringing forth bad fruit. They profane the Sabbath. They take the name of God in vain. They reproach religion and its professors. They are wholly buried up in the world. A hundred times a day they violate the rule to do to others as they would have others do to them. How certain that such do not answer the end for which they were sent into the world. If a fig tree that is good for nothing but its fruit remains barren, it answers no part of the purpose for which it was planted, it is utterly useless. It cumbers the ground. It stands in the way and exhausts the soil. It is fit for nothing but to be cut down and cast into the fire. So those who do nothing for God are only an encumbrance on the face of the earth, a grief to Christians and a stumbling block to sinners. Some of them, by their turbulent passions, keep the world in commotion, 
and all of them by their vain and careless lies spread a moral pestilence around them. And since they will not do any good, they are fit for nothing but to feed the flames which will enlighten the universe into the knowledge of divine justice. Unless they are made of some use in this way, their existence will prove a curse to the universe. We are further taught that God, wearied out with coming year after year, seeking fruit and finding none, at length raises his hand to cut the sinner down, and would send him quick into hell, but that the mediator steps in and pleads, Father, spare him a little longer, and I will try some more powerful means for such a time. If he bears fruit, well. If not, then after that thou shalt cut him down. Now then the manner is fairly at issue. The trial is begun, in view of heaven and earth which is to decide his destiny for eternity. It is to be for a limited time after which, if he remains unfruitful, he will be destroyed without remedy. Awful crisis! Angels look down and tremble for the issue. Here is one put upon his last trial whom Christ seeks to reclaim by affliction. He teaches him as Gideon taught the men of Sukkoth, with briars and thorns. His affairs go wrong, or his health fails, or his friends die. This is the only means selected for the final experiment. If it succeeds well, if not, he is irrecoverably lost. Here is another put upon his last trial whom the Savior seeks to render fruitful by more ample means of instruction and impression. He puts religious books into his hands. He stirs up Christians to entreat him. He gives him more frequent opportunities to attend religious meetings. These are perhaps the only means chosen for the great experiment. If they work well, if not, he is forever lost. Here is a third put upon his last trial to whom Christ presents the example of others pressing into the kingdom of heaven. He shows him a revival of religion with all its solemn attestations and appeals. If this brings him to stretch out his hands to a passing Savior, the trial is happily ended. If not, his doom is unalterably fixed. Here is a fourth put upon his last trial whom the Savior plies with still more powerful means. He is awakened by the Spirit of God. His danger, guilt, and ruin are laid open before him. Perhaps he knows not what ails him and little thinks that the Spirit of God is making the last decisive experiment upon him. How will it issue? No man can tell. Many go back from every stage of conviction and plunge into a deeper hell. If all this light and entreaty can bring him to repentance well, but if he can hold out against the calls of heaven a little longer, he will be left where an angel's voice could not break his slumbers. He will either be cut down like the fig tree in the vineyard, or like that by the wayside, will be smitten with the curse of perpetual barrenness, and left to grow drier and drier to feed a fiercer flame. Here is a fifth put upon his last trial on whom the Savior employs all these means. He sends afflictions upon him. He multiplies the means of instruction and impression. He shows him others pressing into the kingdom of heaven, and he convinces him of sin. He seems determined to make one more thorough experiment upon him. If all this avails well, if not, the wretch is lost for eternity. Infinite mercy interpose and decide the manner favorably. After the dresser of the vineyard has dug around the fig tree and manured it, it will not bear fruit then, what more can be done? It is proved to be an incorrigibly barren, and is good for nothing but to feed the flames. Let it be considered that the time of this last trial is short and precisely limited. The request was, let it alone this year. The probation was only during one season of fruit, just long enough to make one more fair experiment. The moment is fixed in every case when the last trial shall end. That moment may arrive before another morning. And if the trial is continued for weeks, and especially if the person exercised has struggled against the calls, or suffered business or trifling cares to divert them, the evidence of their incorrigibleness may be the sooner obtained, and the trial may now be near a close. God of mercy compels them to seize the critical moment before it is forever too late. And when the last trial is closed and their incorrigible barrenness is evinced, why should not they be cut down and cast into the fire? 
They never will bear fruit. They will only remain cumberers of the ground. Why should they be spared? It is reasonable that barren fig trees, after all hope of their fruitfulness is gone, should be removed out of the way. And since they can be of no other use, should be made fuel for the fire. And if fruitless men had any ingenuousness in them, they would not desire to be left to cumber God's ground. If they will not do any good, they ought not to wish to do hurt. They are exceptions to every general rule. Not all who have passed the last trial without effect are instantly cut down. Some are left to stand as dry trees with which no further cultivation is to be used. They are abandoned by the Spirit and left only to treasure up wrath against a day of wrath. So that in one sense they are in a more awful condition than though they were in hell. The reason of their being spared is distinctly stated in these tremendous words. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, fitted to destruction? They are left to fill up the measure of their iniquity, that the power of God may appear in their more tremendous ruin. Awful thought, after God has held up the heavens for six thousand years, as though nothing had been done, he has occasion to show his power by the blood he inflicts on his enemies. It is not indeed every one who is distinctly called that is put upon his last trial, but the following are among the symptoms, though not infallible symptoms, that the experiment is final. If the man is advanced in years, there is great reason to think that the trial is the last. Few seem to be called after the middle of life, and if at that age a special call is rejected, there is little prospect of another. If the person has formerly lived in revivals of religion and made a mock of them, or even neglected to improve them, it is likely that this is his last trial, that God, seeing so much evidence of incorrigibleness, had lifted his hand to cut him down when the intercessor stepped in and pleaded, Spare him one more season, and I will try another and a more decisive experiment upon him. If he bears fruit well, if not, then after that thou shalt cut him down. If the person has formerly rejected many calls, and now at length is assailed by another more earnest than the rest, it is a symptom that it is the last. It looks as though Christ was determined to try once for all what could be done. Awful crisis. If we stand over a friend in the turning point of a dangerous fever and see nature struggling between death and life, we anxiously watch every symptom. How can we do otherwise in the present case? I would now address myself in the most solemn manner to the different classes who have reason to think themselves on their last trial for eternity but I feel utterly unable to reach that magnitude of the subject. I would fain come at your conscience and heart, but I know not how to bring the whole subject with me. Stretch all your powers to encompass it yourselves while I only suggest a few imperfect hints. Are there any present who have resisted the calls of God all their days and are now exercised with affliction? Justice, wearied out by your long delay, had raised the sword to cut you down when mercy pleaded you off for one more trial. Perhaps the new cultivation was to consist wholly of affliction. How long or how heavy is yet to be determined. If your present sufferings are not sufficient, and good is intended for you, they will be increased. But if they finally fell of producing the effect, and this proves the last trial, you are eternally gone. Up and press into the kingdom of heaven before it is forever closed. Are there any present under the special calls of the Spirit? Here my anxieties become intense. There is reason to apprehend that this is the last trial with you. That exhausted patience had raised a sword to cut you down, when compassion interposed and pleaded you off for one more season. After the word has gone out, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Can you expect another trial? This season is likely to be short, and it is precisely limited. It may end before the setting sun, and if it ends unsuccessfully and prove the last, you must either be speedily sent to hell, or be left to prepare for a heavier doom. How will this infinitely important season appear to you at the judgment of the great day? I beseech you to regard it with fear and trembling. 
Are there any present who in former revivals were stupid and mockers, but now are awakened? Justice had raised a sword to cut you down when mercy pleaded you off for one more trial. And have you not reason to think that this is the last? God has used his most powerful means with you, and what more can he do? And when all means fail, will not the proof of your incorrigible barrenness be obtained? And then that word may be fulfilled, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. Oh, submit before you leave your seats. Are there any present who were formerly awakened by the Spirit of God, but returned to stupidity, and are now awakened again? How few are thus favored the second time! And considering the many calls which you have received from the Word and providence of God, from parents and instructors, can you reasonably expect another trial? Immortal creatures, it is too late to trifle with these infinite concerns. It is distraction to delay another moment. I would next apply the subject to those who were formerly awakened, but cannot now be moved by all that is passing before their eyes. I am at a loss how to consider your case, whether to regard you as still under trial, and these means is sent to make one more experiment upon you, or to view you as abandoned of God, and left only to fill up the measure of your iniquity. While you remain stupid, there is not a particle of evidence that you are not abandoned. And if you continue thus, through the present revival, the evidence will be great that this is your fearful condition. But if not abandoned already, there is every reason to think that this is your last trial. Sleep a little longer and your case will be unalterably fixed, and you must inevitably make your bed in hell. I would next apply the subject to those who were unmoved in former revivals and remained unmoved in this. I have two things to say of your case. The first is that you have had abundant outward means. The second is that God is not obliged to send a spirit when men reject his other calls. Should he close your probation today, you could not complain. It is by no means certain, therefore, but that months ago he raised his hand to cut you down, and mercy pleaded you off for one final experiment. If so, and this fails, you will either be soon cut down or left to treasure up wrath against the day of wrath. For millions of worlds I would not be in your condition a single day. Where is your reason? Are you resolved to go out of the world sleeping? If so, the pains of hell will awaken you to purpose. I would next apply the subject to those who have lived long with an uncertain hope without acknowledging Christ before the world, or taking a decided part for him, or bringing forth fruit. There then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Gilead was the name of the country east of Jordan, which fell to Reuben and Gad and half of Manasseh. As early as the time of Jacob it was celebrated for a medicinal balm known in commerce and which in later ages furnished a figure to illustrate the healing virtue of the gospel. And further pursuing the text I shall take its parts in an order somewhat inverted. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. Astonishment has taken hold on me. Serious indeed must be the state of sinners if a faint view of it can fill the pious heart with so much grief and astonishment. Extreme must be that ruin, a glimpse of which could cause a distressed prophet a cry. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Awful must be that wrath a sight of which could press the blood through the pores of the agonized Savior, and to deliver men from which he could come down from above all heights, to the manger and the garden and the cross. And why will they die? Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why do wretched millions lie weltering in their blood? Why does a demolished world lie in ruins? Why do infatuated nations rush down together to eternal despair? Why must the benevolent cry over a dying world as they did over a wretched Moab. O vine of Sibma, I will weep for thee with the weeping of Jazer. I will water thee with my tears. O Heshbon and Ileela, my bowels shall sound like a harp for Moab, and my inward parts for Kirish. 
Why do multitudes on every side swarm the road to ruin, and urge their impetuous course, and never slack till they plunge into eternal death? Is it because no remedy is provided? Not so. There is a bomb in Gilead, and an able physician there. God has not been wanting on his part. He can appeal to heaven and earth. What more could I have done than I have not done? The providing of this physician and balm proved that men were sick, aye, sick unto death in the whole head and heart. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness. All is wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. The disease has turned the brain and induced madness. Like many other maniacs, while deeply diseased, they fancy themselves in perfect hells. They spurn the remedy and account their best friends their greatest enemies for urging it upon them. They are constantly struggling to destroy themselves. But is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Yes, all the rivers flow with balm, and a physician there is as powerful as God, who offers his healing aid without money and without price. When it became manifest that God must abandon his law or the human race or sacrifice his son, he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, by sufferings never endured by another. The Savior fully answered the purpose of our punishment, and by his obedience he purchased for us all the positive blessings of both worlds. And now if we want pardon, his expiation and covenant claim secure it. If we want sanctification as well as pardon, he is exalted to be a prince and a savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. He is our prophet to teach us. He is our king to rule, protect, and enrich us. He is the firstborn among many brethren, the heir under whom the joint heirs inherit. He is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He is our refuge from all the cares and ills of life. He supplies all our wants and prevents all the evils we shun. In all respects, he is just such a savior as we need. There is an infinite fullness in him. His willingness to save is equal to his power. When our astonished eyes follow him through the labors and sufferings of his life, we perceive not only a willingness but an unspeakable eagerness to save. We see none turn from his door but find him with untiring zeal and pity, seeking the lost sheep upon the mountains. If we go to his gospel and listen to the invitations and entreaties which there forever plead, or if we mark his providence and see the warnings and long suffering there displayed, and the wooings of the Spirit, our impression will be the same. He is infinitely willing and able to save. There is indeed a balm in Gilead and a physician there. Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? The physician himself self has told us, you will not come to me that you might have life. To this charge, however, sinners do not readily plead guilty. They often say, I would give all the world for an interest in Christ, but I cannot obtain it. Well, under strong apprehensions of future wrath, they may indeed consent to part with present comforts to purchase future safety. And knowing Christ to be the only Savior, they may indirectly desire him, just as a sick man desires a disagreeable potion for the recovery of his health. But a direct desire after Christ, arising from a view of his loveliness and the glory of the gospel, never dwelt in unsanctified souls. While the heart remains enmity against God and in love with sin, it cannot desire a way of salvation which lends all its influence to support the law and to condemn sin. But the particular reasons for refusing to come to Christ are selfishness, pride, and unbelief. Selfishness takes the sinner's part and pleads not guilty to the charges of the law, and thus denies the need of a Savior. Pride cannot come down to the state of a criminal and to the feet of Christ, and sue for pardon on account of another. It clings to self-righteousness and makes demands on God, and when denied, rises in angry resentment against him, and then goes to work with greater earnestness under the notion of offering a greater price. Selfishness and pride beget unbelief, and unbelief excludes a realizing sense of everything, of God, law, sin, the Savior, the reality of his appointment, the sincerity of the invitation, and the truth of the promise. The fault is altogether with the sinner. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. His blood, therefore, must be upon his own head. If he mourns at the last when his flesh and his body are consumed, he must pour upon the ear of hell the eternal complaint. How have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof? The harvest is past. The summer is ended and we are not saved. 
What ought deeply to impress us is that this golden season will soon be closed. The summer of life will soon flit away like the evanescent shades of night, and the vision of our worldly hopes and calculations will burst like a morning dream. The joys which we inherit below the sun will in succession soon forsake us, or we shall at once take our leave of them. And even though we outlive all our comforts and for a few days longer water this veil with our tears, yet the end of our pilgrimage will come, a joyful event which will lay to rest many a weary soul, a dreadful event which will soon be to many the beginning of sorrow. Not a person in all those seats, however young, but must soon become a breathless lump of clay, and have done with all the busy scenes of life, with the means of grace, and with a preparation for a never-ending eternity. Our convenient habitations must soon be exchanged for the dark and narrow house, our dearest friends for the company of worms, and our downy pillows for the cold clods of the valley, the places which now know us will know us no more forever. We shall become strangers in our father's house. A new generation will arise to occupy our seats. A few surviving relatives may for a time remember that we lived, but those few will soon follow us to the land of silence. We shall no longer be missed. Our names will be forgotten on earth. Strangers will walk over our graves without knowing that we ever had existence. The world will not be changed by our departure. Seasons will revolve and the sun will arise and set as usual. Mirth and diversion will be as brisk as ever. No one on earth will care for our joys or sorrows while we shall be either spreading our opinions in the regions of a mortal day and skimming the air of paradise, or, oh, how shall I express it, or be tossing on the fiery billows of the wrath of an infinite God, where all the millions of ruined sinners will roar forth the eternal complaint. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Oh, let our excited souls approach and see a wretched sinner looking back to a misspent life with this dismal lamentation upon his tongue. Enter his gloomy chamber, ye who have nerves to endure the sight. Look through the mournful curtains, if room can be found among the weeping friends. See the writhings of his agony. Mark the wild despair of his glaring eye. His quivering lips attempt to speak. Oh, earth, earth, earth! Open and receive a wretch, who is called to appear before an angry God, and who dares not and cannot go. O oh, eternity, eternity! Who can enter thee when thou art filled with fire? O oh, life, Oh, how hast thou been spent? A convulsion stops his voice. Support that sinking mother and that fainting sister. His cries are heard again. A thousand worlds for one more year, for one more day. Oh, my soul, what will become of thee? And must I go? I cannot. And yet I must. I cannot. But oh, there is no reprieve and plunge. I must this moment into eternal burnings. What spectacle so awful this side of the regions of the damned? My flesh trembles and my spirit cries, let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. Or if we understand by the harvest the end of the world, how dreadful will be the condition of those who will then have this lamentation to make. The process of the general judgment will be so awfully interesting as to awaken the strongest emotions of three worlds, to see the judge descend with ten thousands of his saints, the sepulchres of many generations broken open, columns of rising dead filling the air, some with shrieks and some with hallelujahs on their tongues, some surrounded with the glories of the sun, and others stamped with the horrid emblems of the damned, the earth and the heavens on fire, all the works of God in confusion and uproar, the universe disjointed and falling to ruins, the spirits in heaven descending with songs to judgment, the affrighted ghosts of hell coming out of their prison, convulsed with horror, to hear saints and angels shouting their triumphs and thanksgiving, and devils and damn men uttering their most piteous shrieks of woe, and vomiting out their raging blasphemies. Oh, this will be an awful day, and when the moment comes for the two armies to separate to two different worlds, will you not desire to ascend with the righteous? Can your heart endure to be torn from your godly relatives, and as you turn to enter the regions of night to say, Farewell, my father, mother, wife, 
and children. Farewell, ye worlds of light, ye joys which once I knew, and hail, ye haunts of devils, and ye regions of the damned. You are alone or left me of all that this universe contains, and never, never shall I have more. Ye deathless souls, in the name of the eternal God, I charge you not to have in that day this lamentation to make. From the heights of these sublime and awful wonders I descend to earth to cry in the ears of my beloved ears, prepare for the great and terrible day of the Lord. His life in general is a harvest season. Certain portions of it are so in a peculiar sense. So strongly fixed are the associations which are formed in early life, and the habits which are founded on those associations, that the character is generally settled for both worlds before the days of manhood. One of the commonest and most subtle of Satan's temptations is to persuade youth to postpone postpone religion till future life, and to encourage him to hope that little hazard will be incurred by the delay. But never was a greater falsehood uttered by the father of lies. Yet it is his constant resort and the most successful of all his devices. He knows if he can prevail in this, he is likely to prevail finally, and therefore he bends his chief attention to this point. And silly youth, unwarned by the millions thus seduced to ruin, believe and follow him, as the ox goeth to the slaughter slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. My dear young friends, the present is a harvest season of your lives. Could you realize its unspeakable importance? You would not let it pass unimproved. Oh, devote yourselves to early piety. Fulfill the joy of your pious parents, and dry up those tears which have often flowed for you in secret. By remembering your Creator in the days of your youth, let not the almond tree blossom on your heads before he who dwelt between the cherubims has taken taken up his abode in your hearts, when the evil days of age shall come, and the years shall draw nigh, in which you shall say, I have no pleasure in them. May not your dim eyes be then drenched in tears while looking back on your misspent youth, nor your heart surcharged already with sufficient sorrow, be forced to heave the unavailing sigh, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved.' 